being said, um, it is really a pleasure to welcome Eric Lenz. Uh, Dr. Lenz is the Wallace and Lucille K. Renard Professor of Psychiatry, and is about three or four months ago, the Chair of Psychiatry at Washington University. Um, he really has a fantastic history and St. Louis has been in his DNA for years. He was a medical student at Washington University and then conducted his general psychiatry residency there as well. And then in probably what was, I'm guessing, a, a really defining moment for his future career, he shifted and became a clinical fellow at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and then rolled into a research fellowship there at Pittsburgh where he later became a uh, faculty as well. He progressed to associate professor at Pittsburgh until he returned uh, back to St. Louis in 2001, in 2007, yeah. sorry, um, and just quickly had a very rapid acceleration from associate to full professor and then his endowed professorship. Part of the reason uh, why we invited Eric today is because when I think about physician scientist of kind of my generation, Eric is probably bar none, the leading clinical trialist of our generation. And this is true for late life depression, but I'd say that really extends to many things as you'll hear about shortly, that extend well beyond that in geriatric medicine and other geriatric mental health. Um, he's had over 250 papers published in all the best journals from JAMA to molecular psychiatry to biological psychiatry, others, extensive NIH fundings, um, so much money that I couldn't add it all up. I tried and I, my brain couldn't, didn't have the working memory capacity to do it. Um, and his research, although I've always known Eric for his work in late life depression, he's really expanded well beyond that, looking at lifestyle interventions to promote cognitive uh, uh, performance, looking at pharmacologic treatments. He's had mindfulness approaches, has done more work exploring other things relevant to older adults from Parkinson's disease, to cardiac rehabilitation and such. So really a broad range of things where mental health and cognition interface with aging. Um, and then also tremendous work in, on editorial boards and working as NI peer review. Um, personally, Eric has been a good friend. My first memory of Eric is when I was a PGY4 resident uh, at Duke at the time, I was presenting a poster at a jury and our geriatric psychiatry meeting. And this guy walks up to me and introduces himself and says that he's in this fellowship at uh, Pittsburgh. And we start chatting and he, sa he says, are you thinking about doing a research career? I said, well, I'm thinking about it. And he said, you know, this is really good. He said, we need more people like us, more physician scientists to do research that care about old people to answer the questions that really need to be answered. And uh, obviously I still remember that conversation until today. So please join me in welcoming Eric. Thanks for that very uh, warm introduction. I really appreciate that. And I'm really happy to be here at, at you know, one of the real premier uh, academic departments of psychiatry in the country and indeed the world. Um, let's get through the, a bit of a technology virus, which means any technology I touch fails to work. But I don't always, fortunately you have someone who makes things work. There we go. As, as you look at my uh, disclosure of uh, interest, not, not a lot to talk about from there. I'll just say that, um, w Warren, you talked a lot about my research interests. I am also an, an educator in uh, geriatrics, uh, a clinician, uh, an outpatient clinician, and now an uh, administrator. And I think this talk is going to reflect that as well, talking about uh, what we now know about treatment for geriatric psychi uh, psychiatry patients, uh, depressed patients, but also like how to fit it into care, which is a uh, problem that I now have to deal with as chair. So let's think about our, ourselves as a, uh, in terms of the older adults for how, how are we, and, I, and here I don't mean we little batch of geriatric psychiatrists, but how are we as a larger field of mental health and indeed medicine, how are we doing in geriatric psychiatry care? Uh, we'd like to be getting all A's. What are the A's we should be getting? Uh, adequacy of treatment. Are patients getting ad uh, adequate treatment? What about access to mental health specialists? What about use of psychosocial approaches 
And what about the appropriate use of CNS uh, medications in older adults? I would argue that uh, we are not currently uh, getting all A's in these four A's, but I'm gonna talk about solutions uh, for all four to do, uh, do that. Let's start with, what do I mean by adequate treatment? I, I, uh, in terms of uh, treatment, we're talking about using treatments, but also adequate care. Uh, to me, it means uh, two things, using measurement-based care uh, and using treatment algorithms. What is measurement? Um, what, why, why are those things important? Here, here's the key right here. So there's a small band of us throughout the country of geriatric psychiatrists. There are a small handful here. Uh, there's one in my entire health system, uh, and his name is Eric Lenz, and he's also the chair, so he's got other jobs as well. Uh, and so that means we're not the ones managing most uh, older adults with depression. Uh, in fact, most by far geriatric depression care is in primary care. What are the needs in primary care? Two things, one, easy to use treatments, two, pragmatic and feasible treatment algorithms. And I'll go into treatment algorithms again and again. And then I think measurement-based care is actually uh, absolutely crucial here for this main reason. Uh, it is because it finds the people who are not responding uh, to first line, second line, what have you, and need intensification of care. How many of you have gotten a patient referred to you who was put on 10 milligrams of escitalopram for depression six months ago, six years ago, six lifetimes ago, and it was never changed, and they were actively depressed, and they came to you. Um, I don't know. I, so measurement-based care can be as simple as this. This is a PHQ-9, or I, I'm actually somewhat embarrassed to say it's a PHQ-8. Uh, it's missing the suicidality item, so I must have gotten this from one of my uh, suicidality phobic uh, internal medicine colleagues. But what it's showing is someone who, uh, in a very short time, indicated to themselves and their physician, I'm still depressed. You started me on an antidepressant or I started therapy, I'm still depressed. You add up a score of 10, a score of 10 indicates the need for intensification of treatment. Great. So this person, imagine they receive first line care uh, or first line treatment, which is usually an SSRI. Why? Because they're easy to use. They're generally safe, well tolerated. And the good news is that for a treatment naive person, someone who's never had an adequate trial, for older adults as well as younger adults, the chance of remission is pretty high, greater than 50%. Now, those of you in psychiatry will be like, oh, that can't be greater than 50% chance of remission, no way. Remember, we're seeing mostly people who are not treatment naive. If it's your first ever trial, 50% or better if you get an adequate trial in SSRI. But then what? We uh, we need uh, second, third, and beyond line treatments, but we need data. What should be second line? What should be third line? And this has been a lot of my uh, career over the last, especially 10 years. Here's one of the uh, crucial things that we learned about uh, a common second line treatment, which is an SNRI or serotonin reuptake, uh, serotonin norepine uh, reuptake inhibitor. In this case, we were looking at venlafaxine in a large open label trial. The likelihood of remitting depends very much on prior trials. So what you see here is uh, the chance of remitting an older adult with major depression remitting from a, an adequate trial of venlafaxine uh, broken down by what prior adequate trials they have had. Look at the far left people who had, had no prior trials, uh, almost a 70% chance of remission. Uh, if they had had one prior trial, the next bar over, but it was not an SNRI, so it was an SSRI or maybe mirtazapine, about a, uh, almost a 50%, 47% chance of remitting. Uh, and then all the way over to the far right, if they had had two prior trials, uh, and one of them was an SNRI, less than a 20% chance of remitting, somewhere down in the realm of futility. Okay, so this tells us 
This tells us this, first trial SSRI we talked about, second trial, if they've never had one before, uh, uh, an SNRI, still a very good chance of remission. And of course, we know these are uh, typically safe, easy to use in older now adults. Okay, great. You're probably thinking, ah, you know, I, I did psychiatry residency. I kind of know that SSRI, SNRI, what's, what's new? The, over the last about 10 years, we've been working on this next question. What about after two failed trials? And some of the data I'm going to show you in the next several slides is old. Some of it is uh, newer. Uh, this we published uh, several years ago. It was at the time, I believe, the first full-scale trial uh, of any, um, uh, any medication uh, in treatment-resistant older adults with, uh, with depression. Uh, and what we found is what often clinical trials usually uh, find a, a simple answer to a simple question. What we were asking in this is, does medication augmentation work? Meaning in a placebo controlled trial, does the medication work better than placebo? The medication we chose uh, was a newbie at the time, aripiprazole, uh, and we showed that it worked. We showed that it was efficacious, it beat placebo. Um, uh, what you see on the far right is the, rel the re remission rate with the aripiprazole group, 44% versus the placebo group, 29%. Um, and if you say, God, how, how was there a 29% remission rate in people with treatment resistant? Well, th them's the breaks when you do psychiatry clinical trials, I guess. But the number needed to treat of 6.6 compares favorably to other uh, clinical trials in psychiatry and indeed in medicine. So in this study, uh, again, we uh, showed, yes, medication augmentation works. Uh, other data in this study uh, demonstrated its relative safety and tolerability. But what we didn't answer was this uh, key question here is, does aging alter the balance between benefits and risks of antidepressants? So I think what you can think of is a, is a balance that as you get older with more medical illness, more physical frailty, more cognitive frailty, and unfortunately, more and more often, more polypharmacy um, it, uh, is a concern that maybe there's less likelihood of uh, positive benefits, remission from depression, improved well being, and more negative effects uh, like falls and other serious risks. And so that led to this study that we call Optimum. Uh, for optimizing uh, uh, antidepressants in older adults with treatment-resistant depression. This is, or was, a head-to-head -head trial uh, of older adults of uh, antidepressant strategies for older adults with treatment-resistant depression. This was a big effort across five sites in North America, uh, WashU, University of Pittsburgh, Columbia, New York, Toronto, UCLA. Um, with uh, again, some fairly straightforward goals. Which antidepressant strategies were best for older adults? That is older adults with treatment resistant depression, which were most effective, but also which were safest and best tolerated. Um, th this was our original conceptualization, our optimistic conceptualization of the study design. Uh, we were going to randomize 1,500 people, sorry, to, I'm amazed to even say that out loud anymore. We were gonna randomize 1,500 people at our five sites uh, to these three uh, options. Augmentation with aripiprazole, which we previously showed was efficacious. Augmentation with bupropion, another very uh, prominent, commonly used augmentation strategy, and switch to bupropion. So at its essence, we were asking, should we augment or should we switch? Um, and what are the, what are the relative, uh, um, relative outcomes of both? And then uh, to add some further complexity to the study, we said, well, what about for people who don't improve uh, in that step? Uh, we added a second step where we uh, examined a second lithium, uh, a second augmentation versus switch choice. Lithium augmentation, which I guess I'm uh, obliged to say is not a FDA uh, uh, approved for major depression treatment, although there's a lot of good data uh, showing it is efficacious versus a switch to nortriptyline. Some oldies but goodies in uh, geriatric psychiatry. 
uh, and then the focus was on an acute phase uh, uh, to see uh, remission rates and safety, but there's also a continuation uh, phase. This, is, this was the reality that hit. The, uh, this is what we were able to uh, randomize 619 in step one uh, and 248 in step two. So uh, smaller than we ex had expected, but, but still um, you know, a substantial uh, sample size for a geriatric depression study. We looked at remission, well-being, and safety, and I'm gonna show you some of those data right now. But I'm also gonna talk about care. This was a pragmatic trial. And so these depression treatment strategies were being put within a, what we thought was a feasible um, model of depression care, which resembles uh, something like collaborative care, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Um, these people were not seeing psychiatrists every week or every two weeks. In fact, many of them saw a psychiatrist one time or not at all in the trial, very different than my experience in prior trials. Instead, what we had were um, people, usually master's level individuals, checking, at, uh, checking in over the phone with patients uh, every two weeks after the initiation of treatment, uh, doing a PHQ-9, uh, checking adherence, checking um, uh, tolerability, and then making basically a, a, a change based on the data they got. If they were already at a target dose, of the strategy, if they had minimums or absent symptoms, and if they were tolerating the medication, stay the course. If they were below the target dose, if their PHQ-9 score was still high and the medication uh, was well tolerated, dose increase. If they were having problematic side effects, dose reduction or discontinuation, and if non-adherence uh, counseling to overcome barriers to that. And for that counseling, I would point you to uh, Joanne Syrie's very nice study that was published several years ago about that. This, are, this is the characteristics of the sample in step one and step two. Uh, what you see is what I might call somewhat of a young old sample, uh, about almost seven, age 70 in both steps, uh, pr primarily female. Um, for geriatric psychiatry, at least a, a reasonable amount of racial and ethnic diversity although we'd like to see higher than that, a moderate level of depressive symptoms as measured by the Montgomery of Asperger Depression Rating Scale score or MADRAS. And, and uh, most had had uh, two uh, prior adequate antidepressant trials. Mm -hmm. Our first outcome and main outcome was remission. Why? What, or first, what is remission? Remission in depression is defined as the symptoms are reduced to a low level, not necessarily absent symptoms, uh, but a low level. And this is how we defined it. Madras less than 10. Um, probably don't need to remind this group, but uh, why do we choose remission as a primary outcome in clinical trials? It's because depressed people uh, who achieve remission function better and have a lower likelihood of relapse. And for this reason, Many experts in our field do recommend remission as the primary goal of treatment. When you look at our remission data, remember this point, that remission rate is gonna be highly dependent on prior trials, just like the slide I showed you before with venlafaxine. Again, if you're getting your first ever trial of an antidepressant, your chances of remission are about 50%. If it's your third, the chances may be more like about 20%. And these, all these individuals had had at least two prior trials. So uh, this will be an audience participation moment. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you to guess uh, here. I'm gonna start with what the remission rate was for aripiprazole augmentation. It was 29%, okay? Who wants to make a guess for bupropion augmentation? Just shout it out. Higher. Higher. Else? How high? Give me a number. 45. 45, all right, 28%. <laughs> so that's the same. So the augmentation, augmentation. Bupropion switch, any guesses? 23? Uh, no, no one's gonna probably get better than that. It's 19%, so <laughs> low. And uh, our analysis showed uh, that uh, 
both um, both of the uh, augmentation arms versus the switch arm showed uh, trends towards a uh, uh, trends towards a, uh, a difference, and augmentation versus switch was significant. And then we sh we found basically the same uh, the same situation when we looked at overall average madras change, uh, almost double the amount of change with uh, augmentation versus switch. And here's the analysis that goes with that. Conclusion, augmentation beats switch for uh, effectiveness, okay? And then in step two, uh, remember we had, we're looking at somewhat more treatment resistant people now, lithium augmentation versus nortrip switch. Anyone wanna make a, throw out a number for lithium? 40 or 14, that's a good guess, 19%. <laughs> Nortriptyline switch, 22, 22. 20, oh, that was a really good guess, 21 percent. Okay, so in this with in this more highly treatment re resistant population, looking at what we thought were kind of oldies but goodies, uh, you had um, you had no difference. Uh, Madras change showed this same thing um, uh, with no difference, and so there was no winner. Uh, arguably, there were really more like two losers here because remission rates were low. What about safety outcomes? I'm not going to show you all the safety outcomes uh, from this study, just a really interesting one, which was about falls. Okay, Why did we look at falls? Because they're a huge problem in older adults. If you're a child and adolescent psychiatrist, I'm guessing you don't think about falls in any given week. You know. Um, if you're a geriatric psychiatrist, you think about it uh, every day and probably with every patient. Um, this has been one uh, question that has nagged our field ever since I've gone into it. Do antidepressants cause falls? Uh, well, it's, it's conceivable they could, right? Even the safer antidepressants can cause at least subjective dizziness. Uh, some data suggesting some of them can cause uh, reduced reaction time and at least temporary gait changes. Um, that question, do they cause falls, has never, never been uh, answered uh, in a clear affirmative or negative. However, in a study like this, we can at least with a head to head comparison find a fall prone medication or a fall prone antidepressant strategy. In other words, if people are falling more in one group than the other, since they were randomized, we can attribute that to the treatment strategy. So at each follow-up visit throughout the acute phase, we asked about falls. Basically, have you fallen since the last time we talked to you? So this was the fall rate with aripiprazole augmentation, 0.33. Let me explain that. In other words, during that acute phase, which was on average about 10, 10 weeks, uh, we saw about one fall for every three individuals. For context, for older adults, if healthy older adults in the community, you'd expect to see about one fall for every three people in a year, okay? And if you say, well, so that seems like a pretty high rate of falls. I think that's a reasonable, a reasonable uh, uh, conclusion from that. Who, what? So that was, a, uh, that was the rate with um, aripiprazole augmentation. Who wants to make a guess? Higher, lower, same with bupropion augmentation. Lower, higher, uh, uh, relatively about 67% higher. And this actually agreed with some older uh, uncontrolled data that we had published out of Pittsburgh, suggesting that for some um, still not totally known pharmacodynamic reasons uh, and pharmacokinetic reasons, uh, bupropion combined with other antidepressants uh, seem to uh, uh, put uh, old, some older adults at risk for a fall. What about bupropion switch? Right now, you're probably saying, I'm not sure I want to make a guess, but go ahead and guess anyway. Lower. Okay. So uh, somewhere in between. So interestingly, the fall rate risk, the elevated fall rate risk was just seen with bupropion augmentation. Yeah. That is a great question, which I 
which I don't even have the answer to that yet, but I would guarantee that we hadn't even thought to ask ourselves that question, even though it's a really good one. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. <laughs> uh, right, so the, the average age of this group here was a, a just under 70, 69.3, I think. So you, you wonder about, you know, increasingly we're seeing, I, it, like as I've aged, my population has aged as well. I used to see mostly people in their 60s. Now I, in my practice, mostly see people in their 70s. And one wonders uh, about the effects of these increased falls. In them. Thank you. And then lithium augmentation versus Nortrip switch, uh, somewhere in between, uh, about one fall for every two people with lithium, uh, slightly lower, but not significantly so. Uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, even though the sample size was uh, here was re re large for a geriatric depression clinical trial, it was too small to really investigate uh, differences. We didn't find any differences here. So no winner or no loser. All right. So I, th I believe that's all the optimum data I have uh, to talk, uh, talk about. But what I'm going to now talk about is how do these findings fit into care? Uh, and let's talk about then those other A's. So we just talked about adequacy of care and about the role of treatment augmentation um, uh, in attaining that adequacy. What about access net as the next A? Um, because not only treatment is challenging, but access is as well. Uh, in, in my mind, I like to think in terms of sort of like cartoons. So I'm gonna inflict this on you guys. This is how I think about treatment access in primary care. Hey, the antidepressant you prescribe isn't working. What do we need next? See a psychiatrist. There's a six month wait. What do we do today? Oh, crap. <laughs> And uh, we actually did a qualitative um, uh, study of uh, uh, provider, uh, primarily primary care provider perspectives on treatment resistant depression in late life. We published it a few years ago. And providers uh, described what, what could only be uh, characterized as a broken mental health system, a system of care difficult for their patients to access or even navigate uh, with a main barrier being a lack of psychiatric providers, limited ones accepting insurance, limited coverage for behavioral treatments, with one saying uh, poignantly, referring my patients to mental health is one of the most taxing things in my job. And this is not getting better, okay? So this was a very recent article in AAMC News about a growing, growing psychiatrist shortage. The, the US, it says the U.S. had too few psychiatrists even before COVID-19 uh, uh, and together with increased rates of anxiety and depression, um, it was a, it was a, it, a proposed solutions such as partnering with PCPs and innovative digital tools. So what's going on? Cause you're like, you're thinking, well, our residency is uh, creating new psychiatrists every year. Yes, but we have an aging workforce in, uh, of psychiatrists. And I, I'm always stunned to think that I'm actually on the young side, meaning I'm a lower than the mean age of a psychiatrist in this country. And look at that far group, uh, about 40% of psychiatrists are age 61 or older. A lot will retire over the next several years. Um, this is data, this is data from pre-pandemic. And so what we saw seen during the pandemic or what we were seeing pre-pandemic was this gradual reduction in supply as an older generation was retiring. And this is what we saw during the pandemic. We saw, you know, like a bounce, like a spring, a, a, um, a huge acceleration of that reduction as uh, uh, many older uh, people in mental health, uh, providers in mental health, not just psychiatry, right, therapists, how, how easy is, is it to get our patients in to see a therapist right now? In St. Louis, it's all but impossible. Um, but mental health providers across the spectrum uh, accelerated their retirement plans. Um, so, and, and this is going to continue over the, over the next uh, 10 or so years, I think until um, all the residencies, uh, I know ours has, have increased their number of slots and eventually there will be uh, some um, some uh, uh, relief on the supply side. So what do we do about it? 
Well, one is team-based care. So what are you looking at here? This is me talking to my uh, psychiatric nurse practitioner. Um, her name is Jacinda. She is one of the most important professional relationships I have uh, right now in my career. And this is why. Uh, this is uh, data from August 2022, from my first month as chair. I saw 35 patients. Uh, Jacinda saw 112 patients. So one psychiatrist working with a nurse practitioner, one part-time clinician at that working with a nurse practitioner, you can see can see many more patients. And as Jacinda reminds me, uh, also does a lot of between visit management, uh, giving me time to do all that chair stuff. So, and it raised a question for me, well, okay, so it's, it's a numbers game here. How many patients can one psychiatrist manage? Uh, here I'm talking about on the outpatient side. A psychiatrist al al alone, maybe 60 in a week. Uh, if it's primarily follow-up appointments, uh, 60, that would be uh, 60 half-hour appointments. That's 30 patient contact hours. Um, with one nurse practitioner, it goes up to this, that same psychiatrist working with two nurse practitioners goes up to this. And this was known also before the pandemic. It was known to be a solution, but only a partial solution. This is data from, uh, from uh, or this is a conclusion from HRSA, uh, that with that psychiatric uh, psychiatrist shortage, I told you, rapid growth in supply of nurse practitioners and physician ass uh, assistants may help blunt the shortfall a psychiatrist, but not fully uh, offset it. And by 2030, remember this came out pre-pandemic, I would say uh, this is true already, the supply of these providers will not be sufficient. Okay, so even with, even with all the psychiatrists coming out of residency now, even with all the uh, people coming out of psych nurse practitioner and PA programs will not be sufficient to provide any higher level of care than we did in 2017 not fully need, meeting need. So that brings up a second solution. And I was uh, uh, pleased to be able to talk to Dr. Uh, Heckers this morning about um, some implementations of this solution here uh, in, uh, in the Nashville area, which is collaborative care. Uh, so many of you uh, would know about uh, collaborative care, but I'm just gonna speak uh, as if uh, it's, we're all being introduced to it for the first time. What is it? I would call it better or at least adequate mental health care in primary care. So here's the usual situation, a primary care provider and a patient. And here's the problem. The PCP has some but not much mental health expertise and the patient uh, often has more complex needs. So we bring in some more people and tools. What do we bring in to create collaborative care? The key here is a care manager. They're embedded in the primary care practice. They're usually an MSW, but they could be a nurse or, or another um, uh, non-physician uh, practitioner. They do measurement-based care, as I described. They use treatment algorithms, as, as I described. And that, uh, depending on their uh, specialization, they may do brief psychotherapy. Is a psychiatrist involved? Yes, but as a consultant, they supervise the Care, care manager and review patients with them uh, using, uh, using the registry as you see. What are the advantages? This is it, the patient stays in the primary care setting, that's key, and the patient gets rapid access to again, good quality mental health care. So here's an example. Again, I told you I like cartoons. So Mr. Smith, this is the care manager talking to the PCP. Hey, Mr. Smith is seeing you today. He's taking duloxetine, but his PHQ-9 is 15, still elevated. Uh, I spoke to the consulting psychiatrist, and they said to add aripiprazole, two milligrams a day. Can you prescribe it? And I'm also going to do brief psychotherapy with him. PCP says, great, right? And collaborative care doesn't just improve access for that person. It improves overall access to mental health. How is that? If you think about the total percentage of people with mental health care uh, needs, already a PCP alone can, can treat so-called simple depression or anxiety. Uh, I, they, can, they can prescribe an SSRI, for example. Uh, they can suggest maybe you should see a therapist. 
collaborative care can treat the more uh, complex cases of depression and anxiety. The treatment resistant patients who still may respond to second, third line treatments. Um, and then that leaves uh, us psychiatrists for seeing the more highly complex and treatment refractory patients. I, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't remind us that psychosocial strategies work. They work in older adults. There's many evidence-based strategies and they are underutilized. Um, uh, these, this is my top list of uh, tools that I recommend or use for depression, behavioral activation, problem-solving therapy, for anxiety, relaxation training. These are simple, pragmatic therapies that could take only, uh, may take only a few sessions for insomnia, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, reminding us that there are uh, non-psychotherapy uh, uh, non approaches like guided self-help, uh, mindfulness and cognitive training also helpful, highly underutilized. And I also think of psychotherapy as a good augmentation strategy these are older data for my group, not in depression, but in older adults with generalized anxiety disorder, where we started everyone on escitalopram in an open label phase, uh, and then randomized them to either add cognitive behavioral therapy or not. And what you can see is a, a substantial, meaningful uh, further improvement in something called the Penn State Worry Questionnaire, a measure of worry pathology in the older adults who improved with CB, uh, uh, who got CPT. And then finally, uh, as far as the four A's um, is appropriate CNS meds, deprescribing or preferably avoiding them in the first place is an increasingly large part of geriatric psychiatry. Why? Because older adults with any mental health needs, including depression, are on a lot of meds these days, and many of them affect the brain, not just the psychiatric medications uh, that we prescribe or others prescribe but non-psychotropic medications that enter uh, the brain, your bladder medications, your bowel medications, your allergy medications, uh, certainly the sleep medications that enter the brain, uh, over-the-counter medications that enter the brain. Walk through, walk through the pharmacy when you, when you have free time, walk through the over-the-counter aisles of the pharmacy, look at the ingredients on the allergy meds, uh, the sleep meds, then anything with the word nighttime on it, and what you will see is brain toxic medications for older adults. Um, and then uh, again, that all of this leads back to the, uh, the treatment algorithms and probably all of you are thinking, yes, but what? Okay, so you've shown with uh, your two aripiprazole augmentation trials this, we've gotten to a third step. First is SSRI, second is SNRI, third, uh, we would say, we would posit, given the favorable effectiveness and safety data, that aripiprazole augmentation is a quite favorable third-line option. What then? What if those traditional approaches don't work? Uh, what if, indeed? There is, uh, there is ECT, right, that, that uh, is, has been shown to be uh, effective in older adults. There's TMS, likewise. Uh, but there uh, has not been much data on the other uh, new player, ketamine. So with the uh, Optimum team, uh, we uh, started uh, and ran the first, uh, one of the first pilot studies of intravenous uh, ketamine. Uh, like the Optimum data, these data are still not quite yet in press. I was actually looking at my, my uh, email <laughs> before the meeting to see if I could tell you that these were impressed, still not yet. Uh, but, but hey, that means you get to hear about it before everyone else does. Um, we asked some questions about ketamines in older adult. First, does it work? Like what's the remission rate? Uh, is it safe? Because we know ketamine can produce dissociation. There's concerns that these repeat infusions could actually produce cognitive impairment. And there's of course in concerns about uh, blood pressure increases temporarily, temporary ones, but still uh, potentially concerning ones. And what are the long-term implications of it, um, given that almost, uh, that, given that most of the ketamine data to date was with single infusions. So this is uh, what we did in our uh, uh, pilot study, 25 older adults with treatment-resistant depression. 
They got twice a week uh, IV ketamine for four weeks. And then if they showed some, at least some uh, response, then they went into a continuation phase where they got weekly infusions for another four weeks. We use um, as needed clonidine, uh, an alpha-2 agonist, uh, both for control of hypertension as needed. And interestingly, uh, clonidine has been shown to mitigate the psychotomimetic effects, the uh, dissociation and sometimes uh, over psychosis uh, that can occur with ketamine. And these were our outcome. Th these are the outcomes that I'll show you today, the MADRAS and the NIH uh, toolbox uh, cognitive data. This, this is what we found in terms of um, uh, benefits and safety. Uh, the completion rate was high. So 88% uh, of people actually finished at least the acute uh, um, phase. Uh, the response rate, which was generously defined, I think, as a 40% or greater improvement, was almost 50%. Uh, you see the remission rate was, I think, 23 24%. Um, and uh, however, we uh, a good finding was that we had no serious adverse events or treatment-related discontinuations. This was the depression score changes uh, from baseline to acute phase end. You see a a reasonable amount of reduction, and that's preserved during the continuation phase. And then what about the cognitive findings? We actually showed uh, with, a, um, with a scale called the NIH Toolbox Cognitive Battery, a brief computerized battery of uh, primarily executive function tests uh, that uh, give you something called a fluid cognition composite. Think of it as like an IQ score, but for fluid cognition, things like executive function and information processing speed, that people started at a score a little bit below average, but finished at a score uh, above average uh, with mostly ma maintaining that. Uh, now, some of this may have been practice effect as well, but at least it was very promising not to see a worsening, which uh, would have uh, suggested ketamine was producing cognitive impairment. Now, we need more data on ketamine in older adults. I would say we need more data on uh, ketamine, particularly IV ketamine, period, but we need more data on ketamine in older adults. But we can at least at this point put, uh, put together, I think, an algorithm for both treatment adequacy and to think about how to put that algorithm into a care model for access. And so this is what I would propose. Start with an SSRI. The PCP can do that. Um, then as if people uh, don't respond to that adequately and switching to a second line treatment an SNRI and a third line aripiprazole augmentation, this is where I see collaborative care coming in. These uh, second, third, et cetera, line oral antidepressants, as well as, as I said before, brief psychosocial uh, approaches. But then when you get to uh, services like TMS, ECT, IV ketamine, um, this is where we need specialty mental health care. I'm going to just conclude here. I'm, I'm a very pragmatic person. So I would, uh, I like simple things. I like simple principles. And I would argue that simple principles will make the difference here. Uh, Measurement-based care, algorithms, collaborative care in order to improve the access issue, psychosocial approaches, uh, and then again, avoiding or deprescribing bad medicines. All right. I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank my colleagues who are PIs and Optimum. I want to thank the Optimum GSMB, which included Warren Taylor very much. And I think we can go to the questions now. Yes. Thanks for that excellent talk. Um, it's really great to see this clinical trial data coming out. We do need more and more. I'm a child medical psychiatrist um, and, and practicing in collaborative care models where one of the things we have a, a lot of concern about is pediatricians being actually too eager to use atypical antipsychotics. And I'm wondering about your thoughts around kind of given the, you know, we certainly want to be able to use those augmenting strategies when they're indicated and um, want to have those algorithms to promote care, and at the same time, how do we kind of have that balance of pulling back the reins and deprescribing or not encouraging prescription mm -hmm. when it may not be indicated? Okay, so that's a, it's a really interesting question, which I had not 
anticipate it. So we'll see how well I answer it. But a question from a, uh, which I'm told to repeat for our, our uh, audience on Zoom is, uh, given the example of child psychiatry, what you're, you're seeing is somewhat of an opposite problem often is people going too early to uh, what might be considered a third line approach, adding an antipsychotic. And what, and what do we, what do we, does collaborative care, for example, have a role in holding back the reins um, uh, on that? And I would say yes in, in two ways. And let me just start by saying, I am not a child and adolescent psychiatrist. And I am a, a aware that the, um, the risk benefit ratio for uh, atypical antipsychotics particularly with respect to weight and metabolic effects is likely quite different than with older adults. Um, so, so I have to keep that in mind. But one other, one other aspect of treatment adequacy is using the full dose range of a medication. Don't quit on duloxetine when you've gone up to 60 milligrams only and then go right to the next line before you explore the full dose range of a medication. Uh, don't uh, don't add medications without ever subtracting when you know that uh, uh, this augmentation is uh, not working. Don't just keep adding and never subtracting. It's, it's those kinds of problems that are leading our, our patients to be on sometimes five, six simultaneous psychotropic medications. How does collaborative care do that? That's a really good question because usually collaborative care is around appropriate intensification of treatment. And uh, to my knowledge, uh, neither in geriatric uh, care nor elsewhere, have we started to grasp uh, the new era we're in where people are on so many medications that we have to think about pulling back treatments as well. So, all right. Hopefully a very compelling non-answer to that very good question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. A little bit of a follow-up to that, but have you um, That's a great question. So the question was at, at my institution, have we found an effective way to, uh, to communicate uh, like good treatment principles and treatment algorithms to primary care doctors? No, we have not. Do, 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 does that exist? That's a really good question that gets at maybe principles of adult learning. It also, it gets at like exactly Exactly how do you get you know, the algorithm in there when the, the doctor is faced with the patient in front of them? Um, I, 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 I suspect that the answer probably ultimately relies in uh, either some uh, digitally enhanced way of uh, being able to rapidly communicate with uh, uh, a doctor or someone else, maybe through an e-consult uh, or somehow an EHR-based tool which says, hey, your patient seems to need intensification of treatment. You might wanna try treatment X and here's how to do it. That uh, sort of just pops up in front of the uh, primary care doctor at the time. I have to admit, I'm personally skeptical about uh, our usual approach of you know, giving a lecture once every eon or so to a group of primary care doctors who then have 4,000 other things to think about before the next time they're faced with a patient like that. So I, I think uh, this is something that uh, your group has probably given a lot of thought to as well, and may have better answers than I do. Yeah. So, you know, at this point, you know, for us here for now, you know, it's probably about 20 years ago. So we know that it worked. It's just something we found out it worked. Now with the study that you were doing up outside of the laboratory, we're just talking about the street now. Do we, Control for the polyphony. Mm -hmm. You mean in collaborative care? Do we control? Outside collaborative care, you were talking about step one, step two. Ah. Uh, in our in our clinical trials, do we? Can, yeah. So the question was, uh, you know, it, in the clinical trials, did we control for polypharmacy? Um, it, it, which I'm taking to mean, did we try to diminish diminish polypharmacy? Or, 
or, or, or did that, uh, yeah, did that factor into the patient selection and thereby raising questions about the general generalizability of the findings? Re really good question. What I can say is that uh, in both of those studies that I presented, our initial uh, more pure efficacy trial, as well as the optimum trial, which was meant to be a real, a real world care. These were people uh, coming primarily from primary care, more of an effectiveness trial. Uh, we did simultaneously try to deprescribe um, uh, medi medications uh, while we were uh, uh, doing this, uh, while we were doing these augmentation and switch options. Um, that can be pretty challenging. That can be pretty challenging to do even in collaborative care. I do think, uh, I think it's probably possible for a collaborative care manager uh, under the supervision of a, a well-trained psychiatrist who's comfortable with deprescribing uh, to work with that PCP on deprescribing. Uh, but I do admit that I think neither the existing collaborative care studies uh, nor most of these studies have really grasped the issue with poly, polypharmacy that we're now seeing ourselves in. Well, Eric, thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, you shared with us two potential approaches to close that gap between available treatment access to those treatments, integrating nurse practitioners into the team mm -hmm. and collaborative care. Mm -hmm. How do you, at this point, weave that into your mission as a chair of a psychiatry department that traditionally has focused on medical students and physicians? Mm -hmm. So if you think about the home for those providers, whether mm -hmm. that's the nurse practitioners or the massive care clinicians, mm -hmm. kind of where are they now in your system? Where are they home-based? And how do you think about that as your new task as a chair? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, Dr. Hoffman asks, for these proposed solutions, nurse practitioners, uh, care managers who are often uh, MSWs, how do they fit within the mission of an uh, academic psychiatry department, which ours, like, like yours, is, has been uh, traditionally focused on teaching uh, and training medical students and residents and fellows uh, and research with with frankly, a, enough clinical care to meet those other missions, but traditionally no more than that. And then I'm coming here saying, well, and then we're gonna solve mental health uh, access uh, by adding these. And so how does that fit in? Uh, and just to let everyone know, Dr. Hoffman was not doing this to stump me. We actually talked about it earlier this morning. So, so but, but I still don't know the answer to that. I think uh, as, we, as we talked about it seems like there's two possibilities. One is simply for us as psychiatrists to be willing uh, and confident, and maybe that does need to be woven into our training to do team-based care, to do collaborative care. I didn't learn how to do team-based care in residency. I didn't learn how to uh, do collaborative care until many years after uh, residency. Um, but and, and I can tell you that our current psychiatric trainees uh, find these concepts uncomfortable as well. <laughs> the larger question is, do you enlarge the department's mission to have, uh, because you know, based on the model I showed, uh, you would have for every practicing psychiatrist, two nurse practitioners. Uh, and for every uh, psychiatrist doing collaborative care, maybe, maybe right 10 social workers who are in various primary care practices. And how does, uh, it, does that then uh, obscure or diffuse the department's mission? I really don't know the answer to that question. Uh, um, I think, you know, the, the two possibilities are, right, to say we're comfortable to work with nurse practitioners uh, and MSWs uh, coming from outside of our department, or to say we want to have them in our department and you know, so we needed like a division of nurse practitioners. We need a division of social work in our department. I don't know the right answer. There. Thank you. I don't. I don't know any of these answers though. So uh, yeah. yeah, one from the. I have, I have one from the Q and A. Uh, Dr. Gortzman asks, "What doses of ketamine did you use in your trial, and was it variable dose or fixed dose?" Great. Uh, the, yeah, the question: What dose of ketamine did we use in the trial? Which apparently. 
That one I can answer. We did. We answered. Uh, we used uh, uh, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram in a 40-minute infusion. Just the standard dosage uh, that has been used for the last 20 years with ketamine. Uh, does that does that work well enough? Uh, is variable dosing better? A great great questions that need to be answered. I think we actually need to wrap up uh, this work just now. Uh, but uh, thank you for coming. Thank you all. Thank you.